the meat of the matter. Welcome everyone to the 2021 Barbara Pittard Payne Lecture in Gerontology, sponsored by the Gerontology Institute at Georgia State University. My name is Elizabeth Burgess, and I'm director of the Gerontology Institute at Georgia State and professor of gerontology and sociology. And I'm excited to have you here for this virtual event. Um, those of you who have come to the Payne Lecture before know that this is an endowed lectureship we have in the Gerontology Institute that is usually a time where we build community, where we welcome community who are working in the field of aging and alumni to Georgia State's Gerontology Institute campus. And we can't do that today, but we can get together this way, and we're doing it in conjunction with the Southern Gerontological Society, which I'll talk about in a minute. For those of you who haven't heard of this event, I want to tell you a little bit about why it's such a special event in the hearts of those of us who are here in Atlanta. Barbara Pittard Payne was the founding director of the Gerontology Institute at Georgia State. And then it was called a center. And she was even here before it was a center. It was just a program. And um, she really set a strong foundation on which we have stood for years in terms of building gerontology. And when she retired, um, there wanted to be to create something in her memory and in memory of the strength that she brought to the university. And so this lectureship was developed in her honor and is now given in her memory. And it's made possible by donations from Barbara's family and from students and alumni and community who continue to give to allow us to bring in really esteemed speakers each year. And we're excited to do that and to welcome people who have helped make this happen. Uh, Barbara Payne's daughter, Betsy Stiles, I'm hoping is on the call today. Um, she was uh, happy that she was going to be able to attend because she could not have made it to a face-to-face -face this year, but she was going to be able to make a virtual here. conference. I'm here. Yay. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, Betsy. It took three people to get me here. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you, Betsy. This is, this is our legacy here. Um, the GSU Gerontology Institute uh, has um, been around since the 1970s. The first programs in gerontology began in at Georgia State, and we have hundreds of graduates of our program, including Betsy, uh, who's not only a daughter of the founder, but an alumni of the program. And we are um, a force to be reckoned with. And I'm used to being able to see everybody here. And frequently we've said, raise your hand if you're an alumni, raise your hand if you're a faculty member, raise your hand if you're a student. So um, I'm not gonna ask anybody to do that now, but after the event, we'll have an opportunity to show our faces and raise our hands and celebrate the history that is Georgia State gerontology. Um, I want to thank the committee members who made this possible, and that's Jennifer Craft Morgan, Ishan Williams, and Tim Jansa, who have dealt with a lot of the a lot of the issues that are involved in creating an event like this. In addition to Leanne and Amanda from SGS, who have dealt with the logistics, because we're partnering with SGS which is not only an exciting thing for Georgia State and for me, but I think many of you know, Barbara was a founding member of SGS and she was in the first class of GRITS. And so to be able to celebrate Barbara as a gerontologist rooted in the South, as we say in SGS, um, is really a great way to bring together these two organizations. Um, I want to do a couple of reminders for people as we get started. We have an ability to turn on videos, but we're going to ask you all to turn off your videos and mute for now. After the lecture is over and we're done with the questions and answers, we're going to celebrate and you'll have an opportunity to turn your videos on again. So for now, let's turn off our videos. Following my remarks, Ishan Williams is going to introduce our speaker today. 
And um, then we will have a lecture from Dr. Whitfield, followed by a period of Q&A, and then stick around for some music and a reception and a chance to get together socially a little bit. So I'm going to turn things over to SGS president, Ishan. Floor is yours. Um, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Burgess. I am really happy to be here, and I just want to thank you and the Georgia State University Gerontology Institute for partnering with SGS for this um, to offer this year's pain lecture. So thank you so much for joining with us in this partnership. It has been a great pleasure of ours, and I know to our membership to have the pain lecture during our conference. So we have really been very um, appreciative and, and thank you for that. But without further ado, um, while you all are here, um, I would like to introduce to many my colleague, Dr. Keith Whitfield, but a very dear friend and mentor to myself. So I'll say a little bit about Dr. Whitfield and then I'll turn the floor over to him. Dr. Keith Whitfield is the 11th president of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He is the immediate former provost and senior vice president of academic affairs and a professor of psychology at Wayne State University. He received a bachelor's in psychology from the College of Santa Fe and master's and PhD degrees in lifespan development, developmental psychology from Texas Tech University. And he did a postdoctoral work in quantitative genetics at the University of Colorado Boulder. His research on individual differences in minority aging employs a two-pronged approach that includes studying individual people as well as members of twin pairs. Dr. Whitfield's research examines the ideology of individual variation in health and individual differences in cognition due to health conditions. Dr. Whitfield has worked with researchers from Sweden, Russia, and the United States to examine how social, psychological, and cultural factors of cognition and healthy aging. He has been a continuously funded researcher for more than 20 years through NIA, NIH, and NSF with projects totaling more than $18 million. He has authored or co-authored over 200 journal articles, books, and book chapters. His current research project focuses on the relationship between stress and longevity in African-American families living in North Carolina. Please help me welcome Dr. Keith Whitfield. We do our claps this way, but all the cameras are off, but you and I, Elizabeth, so welcome Dr. Whitfield. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams, and thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. It is a, an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I actually was, uh, Fine, you know, it's, it's funny whether you get nervous for talks uh, when you do as many as I've done over so many years, but uh, having Miss Stiles on, it made me a little bit nervous. So I'm gonna calm down and make sure that uh, I get in a groove, but I'm, I'm honored to have you here and uh, uh, celebrate uh, the memory of, uh, of your family and how they have gotten this wonderful uh, speaker series started. So I'm going to share with you all today uh, thoughts that really have evolved over 30 years. Uh, don't like to date myself, but that's about how long it's taken. And it's about decomposing variation in health and aging in African-Americans. And that starts off with the premise of that everybody's not the same and that there are differences in depending on what we look at. Uh, as you look at any uh, group of people, however specific that may be, but that um, it's uh, good to be able to do, uh, let's see, here. Uh, to take a look and, and to think about that, particularly related to health. And um, I think that uh, I'm particularly um, uh, mindful of the moment that we have in time of where we just had uh, the uh, George Floyd verdict and thinking about social equity and social justice. Um, we have a, that was, that was monumental. Uh, but we have a long way to go. And, and health disparities actually represents one of those areas that we do need to be able to make some progress. So for example, as you look at African-Americans compared to Caucasians, they have higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, fatal stroke, heart disease, death, and end-stage uh, kidney disease. And these numbers may be a little bit old. And actually, I think about the other moment that we have in time, which is, is living in a pandemic, where we have seen that 
uh, the death rates for older Americans is extremely high. And we also see differentials uh, in uh, death rates by race from COVID. Um, so I look at these numbers, uh, these numbers relative to life expectancy, and think that they are going to be impacted by the pandemic that we currently sit in. But you do see that there's, it's been this way for a long time of about a five or six year difference um, as you compare African Americans to the overall population. So let's make sure that we know what we're talking about relative to health disparities, that health disparities are adverse, health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive, sensory or physical disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity, geographic location, and other characteristics historically linked to discrimination and inclusion. That is a heck of a mouthful. But what it means is, is that we can't think that um, by simply looking at age, that that is a homogeneous group, that there's lots of ways in which you find interesting differences between groups of people or people within those groups. Now, health disparities, particularly as we look at them relative to uh, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, are, is very important for a number of reasons. One is, is that the economy loses about $309 billion a year due to some of the effects, the direct and indirect effects of disparities. Um, uh, it limits the continued ability for us to be able to improve health for everyone because I think that as we think about social justice, health should be a, a requirement, uh, uh, you know, something that everybody deserves to have. But as we look, 30% of the direct medical costs for Blacks, Hispanics, and Asian Americans are excess costs due to health inequities. And we have to really put that into perspective because by the time we get to 2050, and this may still be affected by the pandemic, I'm not sure, um, I'd love to hear our demographers see if we've got a handle on whether we think that um, the shape of our age distribution is going to change due to the pandemic. But over half of the population by 2050 should be, or supposed to be, or was on track to be people of color. So it puts in mind um, just how important health disparities are because they affect everyone, not just the people who happen to be affected by uh, the different uh, uh, health conditions. Now, there's lots of reasons why health disparities exist. This is, this is an extremely partial list. So just go with me here. Uh, differences in access to healthcare, uh, differences in treatment, um, same symptoms, different treatment. I think that some people don't think that that happens. There have been a couple of studies, one out of Hopkins that has looked and seen that when an African-American and a white person walk in, present the same symptoms, they can, not everyone does, but they can get different treatments. Um, there's also issues with delay in seeking treatment that African-Americans about three times longer uh, for uh, getting treated for my myocardial infarctions uh, than other groups. There are also these other things that I think are fascinating, and those are differences in cultural beliefs about health, like claiming it. Now, if we were in person, I would say, who understands what claiming it means? Claiming it is the idea that if you don't say that you have it, you don't have it. So if the doctor um, says, well, you've got hypertension, Keith, and I go, nah, I'm not claiming it, that ain't me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna take uh, that and you can't put that on me. Um, that also has a problem and, and has lots of different issues that are around it. Um, there's also, as we look at African-Americans in particular, uh, historical self-medication or use of alternative medicines. And one of the other things that's come up with COVID um, that uh, as you have, have seen, I think it's particularly uh, a big issue in the South is the idea that I don't want to be experimented on. And that's in part the legacy of the Tuskegee experiment. Um, it was a long time ago, but not long enough ago that people have forgotten it. Um, and as we're looking at a vaccine, and I can say that I am vaccinated um, in, in my role, in my position, I am a big advocate for people getting vaccinated. Um, I can understand though how people can see a drug, uh, a vaccination, a vaccine that has come to market so quickly and wonder whether it's experimental in nature. And so those are very valid concerns and fears, but I really do hope that everybody gets, who gets a chance to makes the decision to become vaccinated. There are also other biobehavioral consequences of uh, social inequities, including racism, poverty, where we live, the context, the neighborhood we have um, can be very different in terms of the resources that it offers, in terms of some of the geographic barriers. Uh, there's also education, which is really a proxy for SES, but it impacts 
uh, work opportunities, neighborhood selection, social mobility, and lots of other things. Now, I want to try to lead you to think a little bit differently because we use the term health disparities, you know, pretty synonymously with anything that is done to study uh, health in ethnic minorities. But when we're looking at health disparities, <clears throat> we ask the question, how are groups different? Whites are often treated as the gold standard from which differences are studied from. But what we don't have as good a handle on is why are those groups different? And it comes from the kinds of questions and how we ask those questions that oftentimes it's just looking for a difference, but it's not the explanatory factors that actually drive those differences. Now, if we were to take the perspective of minority health, it kind of begs a different sort of question. For example, what is the status of health within that particular group or groups? And when we take it from that perspective, I think what is interesting, it's almost freeing in a way because you can be successful, you can have successful and healthy aging uh, actually occur in the groups and, and look at it in that everybody is not this difference which tends to be lesser than the gold standard, that there is healthy aging and healthy people that are in these groups. There's also a paradigm called the model minority paradigm, which is the idea that these are the folks that have really adjusted well and, and you know, stress and discrimination don't affect them in the same way. Um, but that for the most part still ex, uh, represents extremes in many minority populations. Um, but we have to come to the conclusion and I think minority health as a perspective does that of that by variability exists, suggesting that we're not all alike, um, that there are those differences, those individual differences that actually happen within populations. So in today's presentation, and I'm trying to keep an eye on time because uh, I don't know if you all noticed, but I am a president now, and uh, I don't get a chance to do as many talks as I used to. So this is a wonderful treat for me as well. Uh, but I'm gonna try to get through a lot of information. I'd be happy to talk back about any of it. Actually, I'm even happy to share these slides if there's any interest in them as well. But in today's presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some issues around within and between group uh, analyses and, and, and studies, variability as just a thought and a, concept, and a concept, and then share with you uh, some different ways in which I've used family research to be able to get at that variability and also to address within and between group issues. So let's start with the within and between group. You know, what really is at heart here again is what question is asked. I've helped um, a good number of students that started off and said, well, uh, my committee won't let me study just uh, African-Americans and I go, well, what was the question that you asked? And he said, well, I wanted to know what the difference is. And I said, well, as soon as you said that, you set it up so that there should be a comparison between them. You have to make sure that you pose your question in the right way. Um, but when we do those comparisons, it's typically comparing a minority group to the majority. And if you look in the literature, you will find very few examples of when minorities actually do better than majority. And whether it be health, cognition, um, whatever it is. Um, comparisons are conducted with the, with the idea that they're going to help to us to understand <clears throat> health in minorities. But what's really Gardner from comparison research just is that there's a difference. And that tells us something, but not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Now, there's a wonderful paper on uh, explaining cultural differences by uh, Anne-Marie Cousey back in 1998. Gosh, it's getting so old, but it's a very important paper. Um, it talks about three different models of that when we do between group studies, we're going to come to certain kinds of explanations. And even historically, those explanations have changed. For example, the cultural deviance model is the idea that when you find a difference or deviation between groups, that group that's not doing as well is seen as deviant or inferior. Now, while that sounds extreme, um, go back to papers that looked at differences between groups in, in the 70s, even in the 80s, and you will see this sort of model, this sort of thinking happen. I wanna say that in the 70s and later, there was hopefully a change to more of a cultural equivalence model where the idea of socioeconomic status really provided a bunch of advantages and the deviance uh, perspective is attributed to advantages due to culture. And so it tries to explain away uh, in a different sort of way that deviant perspective. 
And I want to believe that now we have much more of a cultural variant model in explanations of differences where we do appreciate and think about and explain resilience in the face of oppression, of adaptation and survival due to external forces. And the explanations that we get of the differences should be culturally rooted internal explanations for those differences. As we do between group comparisons, the very standard, the very elementary way, I know that there are some students out there, you are taught to do mean comparisons between groups. Um, there's so much that goes into that, we could have a statistics lecture and, and talk about all of some of those, those issues that go on. Um, but I would even suggest that variance differences are probably a little bit better way to go in comparing groups, and this is not done very often. Uh, but you get the underlying distribution, you assess in variance between the groups, and hopefully it may uh, lead you to thinking about the other variables to co-vary to explain what may be happening in the differences between groups. Let me give you a little example. Um, I pulled this from a national data set. If you look at the, the data on the right, it's for whites on a measure of cognitive functioning. And the, the picture on the, well, depends on which one is your left and your right. <laughs> the one on the right panel uh, that says African-Americans is for African-Americans. Now, if we were in person, I would ask you, are those two the same? Does it look like the distribution, the spread is the same? And if you were remember your elementary statistics class, you were always told to plot your data. And if you plot your data, this is what it looks like. Well, you would, I hope, look at these and say, no, they don't look the same. And that um, that difference suggests that you shouldn't be doing comparisons, that you shouldn't be doing those analyses because one of the very basic tenets of, of doing particular analyses of mean differences is that you have homogeneity of variance. And when you do a simple test on these data, you find that it fails that uh, basic premise. And so it really gets to the heart of thinking of when and how we should do differences and how we think about doing differences. Um, some of this is connected to even issues around sample size and the power to be able to detect those differences. I would argue that if you look at most studies, what you find is that, um, and people use this argument, and I think it's, it's, it's okay, but not sufficient, uh, that, well, you know, there's only 14% African Americans because that reflects the population. But so it means that in a sample of 1,000, you would have 860 people that were white and only 140 who were African American. Do you really think that you're capturing the variability or even, let's go to the statistical thing, do you think you have the statistical power to de determine differences? And it depends on what it is because you need to actually do a power test of, of what the effect sizes are, but um, in many cases you don't have that. Um, sample sizes need to be more than just representative. Um, the variance need to be equivalent between those two, um, just as we were showing in that uh, example of cognition. And in the past, oversampling has been done to try to get equivalent uh, sample sizes so that efficient, effective, and valid measures can, uh, comparisons can be done. Um, the challenges is typically involving getting sufficient numbers of ethnic minorities to participate. I think that uh, the National Institute on Aging has done a good job at trying to address this issue um, by really saying how many people are in our clinical studies um, and seeing how many uh, really do not have sufficient numbers of people to ever look at racial differences. Uh, and they, I think, been very, doing a very good job at trying to address that issue. You know, it goes beyond just even the sample size numbers that there is issues relative to uh, measurement and the error that goes along with that. Um, just a couple of simple takeaways of that precision of measure um, of how close a parameter estimate is expected to be the true value of what you measure meaning that precision by smaller groups sometimes um, uh, is, is what's driving the precision because if it's, it's wonky in that, it's, it's, it's even different than in, in the larger sample. Instruments used uh, to measure a construct of interest have to have the same meaning across groups, including measurement error and equivalence across those groups, um, meaning that you need error measures that don't have cultural bias. And I can tell you, I've been around long enough that there used to be a time when we were very concerned about the, those differences. And it seems like we do less of that comparison now to make sure that measures actually work the same in one group in terms of another. 
But we have to look at equivalence on a lot of different levels of cultural, conceptual, linguistic, functional, and scalar. And um, there's, I can tell you about the differences there, but I'd rather move on. What I'd rather have you do is, as you see down here at the bottom, there is Whitfield et al. 2008, which is a Journal of Gerontology article, which talks about all of these. It talks about the, the, the models uh, of difference uh, and talks about all of these issues. And um, I'm always looking to try to increase my uh, citation index. So take a read of that paper. It's a great read. And then you'll have some of that information. Um, in addition, we have to think about interpreting results. Uh, it's, it really is actually difference in, in people's perspective when you get them to think about that differences can actually represent strength, that differences may represent people's adaptation to lack of resources, of oppression, of, for lots of different things, and that the differences that you find may actually represent strength, and that's a different way to write our papers and to conceptualize the differences that we find. Also trajectories of change may be different and that the more assessments that we have, the better. And I've suggested this and I've, in my research, I've done very few uh, cross group studies, um, but I always think that this is a good idea of adding a measure of kind of culture ethnicity or acculturation um, could be used to examine the moderating or mediating differences that you find across groups. And I think that's more of a suggestion or a helpful hint for those of you who do do between group research uh, more than anything else. So that's between group. Maybe we can think about within group differences. This is what I've spent a lot of my career doing. Um, the strengths are that you understand the variability uh, on measuring a specific group and the error of measurement is limited to the measure and not to ethnicity. The weakness is, is that it does limit the description of the phenomena that can be made because it is only one group and not a universal group of aging, 20 year olds, 80 year olds, whatever it may be. Uh, one of the things that I have been challenged by a lot of people in the field is, well, so which should be, which should come first? Should between group research come first or should within group research come first? Um, since we're virtual and, and nobody can uh, uh, throw anything at me, I'd say within group. As much between group research as we have, I really think that if we don't do within group research first, we don't understand what we're comparing. We may not be comparing apples to oranges. Um, so which should come first? We'll just see. Let me now go on to talk a little bit about individual variability, which is a part of why um, using a between group or within group approach uh, may have some challenges to it. But this is more about looking at the data and thinking about how we're going to make some of those, those assumptions or those conclusions about what we see. So here's an example. I pulled it from some of my data from uh, my twin study. And it just looks at individuals and the progress of what we usually see as people get older. What do you find? But the performance on this is the digit symbol substitution test, a measure of speed. Um, it goes down as we go over, uh, as we go to older ages. But you know, that's our means. Remember about how means can kind of lead us astray. And that as good statistical people, we want to make sure that we actually plot the data. When you plot the data, this is what you see, which is, is that there's a lot of variability there. Um, everybody is not on that fixed line that we see. Uh, that regression line really represents um, uh, uh, regression to the mean, but it does not necessarily represent what we see here in terms of the variability in performance. Now, this is a new slide for me. I just started thinking about all of the variation that we see in, in health and thought about some of the main possible contributors to variability as we look within a group that you might find in terms of health. Now, there's more than that. Actually, even that's the reason why I have these open spaces because I know that there's more than just these main things. But here are some, some, some just kind of conceptualizing and thinking about variation in health. <clears throat> and I think it's important to even think about the sources and try to categorize them. I'm gonna do it in two different ways. So. Uh, stay with me on this. Um, you can think about it in two very broad swipes about variability that impacts health in terms of biological things like nutrition or genetics, and also environmental things that have impact health like psychosocial factors like SES or discrimination, or where people live in the neighborhoods that they're in, or even the family environment that they exist in. 
And then you get to the next level of complexity and thinking not only are those individual categories, but those categories sometimes uh, interact or may be additive. Uh, and that's uh, two different ways to think about this. For example, the biology uh, and environment might be uh, stress and nutrition. And I think about James Jackson's compensation model when I think about that, of that people are reacting to stress by changing their nutrition. And so it's how those two things may be either additive or interact or bio and bio, salt and salt sensitivity, uh, a big uh, factor within hypertension, particularly among African-Americans. Um, but that salt gives you a certain kind of cessation um, to making sure that you feel full or you get that uh, uh, great feeling of comfort food. And then environment and environment of um, some of the work um, oh, that uh, uh, Sherman James did. Thank you. Whew, I had to think about it for a second. Um, that looked at uh, discrimination and coping and really looked and saw that there was a gradient that was affected differently as he looked across uh, different SES classifications. So all very interesting parts and pieces. There's a different way that you can think about some of those same things as well in terms of internal and external sources. Internal sources, I structure them into two different things of stochastic and structural. Stochastic means it's something that's kind of, it pops up, it, it happens at a particular moment and then it may go away, it may come back, it may you know be dormant for a month, whatever, but it's that particular moment that you look at and it could be a psychological moment. Structurally, we can think about genetic and physiology. Those are things that are internal to an individual. Uh, externally, we can think about those same uh, different dimensions of stochastic and, and structural, but stochastic, maybe we're thinking about a historical moment that happens in time. So it's not the person's mind thinking about what's going on, uh, but, but what's actually happening and can document in time. And those who do uh, studies of, uh, of lifespan actually are very interested in this. Uh, structural pieces can be things like the built environment of where we live, the spaces, the roads, the walkways, the parks that we have. And then there can also be social factors like neighborhood and family. Um, you see these different dimensions as we can look at some of the behavioral theories of health and aging. Um, allostatic load, for example, uh, is the cumulative effects of, of poor biology profiles and social conditions create differential mortality and morbidity or the weathering hypothesis or the social buffering hypothesis, or even the double jeopardy hypothesis. These are things where um, there are clearly some interactions at different levels that ultimately produce better or worse health and are very important to understand. But behind each one of them is behavior. And here's another way of thinking about variability in behavior. And I roll this out because sometimes people go, well, how do genes um, hit behavior? How does that actually happen? And it's not a simple set of uh, relationships. Actually, it's very, very complex. There are things that are uh, gene environment interactions, difficult, but not impossible to understand. And then there's environmental factors that, that impact brain chemistry and genes that impact brain chemistry. But another route is the idea that environment actually impacts genes, which ultimately impact brain chemistry in addition to maybe their direct effects. And that those things then change our behavior. You may still not get it. Let me, let me take you one step further. Let's think about genetic and environmental influences on complex behavior, those behaviors that are underlying um, stress and discrimination and all those things that we're looking at relative to behavioral aspects of health that actually have impacts on physiology, bio biology. Um, we can start here thinking about uh, how DNA transcribes to RNA. And as we think about our vaccines, remember they are actually ways in which uh, People have now worked with uh, uh, messenger RNA and different aspects of RNA uh, to create the vaccine that, that's helping our bodies to be able to protect ourselves from COVID. But from that RNA that transcribes and makes proteins, which those proteins create uh, neurotransmitters, which those neurotransmitters are driving those behaviors that we think about and create phenotypes, things that we can actually see. But it doesn't just stop there because those phenotypes are then influenced by, let's consider these behavioral or environmental uh, field factors that end up influencing them at different levels. And then we start to see something that looks like our behavior, but it travels through a very complex set of interrelationships and factors uh, that, that occur over time or, or, or depending on what this end 
uh, factor is about how much is actually been uh, they being influenced by different things. So those types of variations, I think, are very interesting when you think about the psychological moment and genetic moment and historical moment. Um, you know, all of those, interestingly to me, come back down to another factor, which is family, um, because they have both internal pieces because of the genetics piece, the psychological moment, because you may be seeing your family, the historical moment, because it's within your family, um, and even where your family lives, um, the built environment, the neighborhood. So uh, I think about family research as being a very useful tool to be able to study and understand the health of particular groups. And of course, I'm going to suggest that we should start with within group. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But let me first give you a little bit of uh, family design 101. Um, that as we take a look and think about uh, uh, family designs, there's at least three kind of general categories, intergenerational, parent offspring, and sibling. Now, um, you know, don't necessarily look at the guy there, but uh, look at his uh, uh, little baby granddaughter. And uh, every time I look at this picture, I think both of us must be saying to each other, what are you looking at? But it would be interesting to be able to look at the similarities between me and my little granddaughter. There's different ways in which the behaviors and things are actually transmitted. Um, some of them may be from a conventional way where you get from grandparents to parents and parents to, to children. Um, but there's also uh, points where there can be kind of passover where things happen between the grandparents and the grandchildren. Um, we joke all the time that uh, my little granddaughter there is more like me than she's like her, her mother uh, and father. And I always take great pride in that. We can also have parent offspring uh, comparisons and designs. And here's uh, another example of me. And this is my mother. I was going to say her age, but she told me not to. Uh, and we are at one of the uh, UNLV um, basketball games uh, that only allowed like, you know, 10 people in it or something like this. This was a while ago, another impact of the pandemic. Um, but in parent offspring, typically what we do is to take and look at influences and similarities between parents and see how similar those may be towards offspring. And in that way, we're going across generations. There's also ways that we can look at siblings. And uh, this is a picture from long, long ago of uh, myself and my two brothers and my sister. And uh, I'll talk about each one of those here. Um, so we could look at siblings and that would just be looking at sibling one versus sibling two. Um, you know, comparing them and that would be an analysis of that we would do within generation. We can look and see because that's telling us something about the family context that, that uh, people live in and operate in. And um, with all of these, I wanna take a step back and just remember, think about not just doing them in younger people, but doing them as we age and to think about all the things that happen uh, and to think if you still find similarities between siblings, if they're living in different places, if they're living in different families, if they're living in different houses, it kind of the similarity suggests the power of what a family actually provides, that it's not something that's just temporary from, you know, in traditional ways of thinking of zero to 18, it lasts longer than that. Um, it may last a lifetime. Um, I think, uh, let me see, I'll go back here and just highlight that this is my sister and she was adopted. And so um, she is our perfect little, uh, our little example for um, thinking about adoptive studies. And in adoptive studies, typically what they do is to look at custodial parents and biological parents and think about how the biological parent um, may have contributed um, to a, an adopted child, but the adopted child's in a family. And so both uh, those parents contribute, but they contribute environmental factors versus in this biological to the adopted, it is, in my example here, the, 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 the red, which is as genes, genetic influences. But we also get this very powerful way of being able to look at the environment that is different with a different set of genes, but in an environment that is similar to what that sibling has, which the sibling has both genes and environment, but this one only gets the environmental piece at least from that set of parents. 
hope all of that makes sense. What's interesting is, is we can look within and across generations as we do that. So then we talked about adoption under siblings, but we can also take a look at twins. And if I was with you in person, I would ask how many twins are there and have you raise your hand. And of course, then I would try to give you uh, uh, an interview and try to collect some data on you. Um, but, um, you know, twins are fascinating. There are ones who share either half um, or all of their uh, genetic information. And then at least early on, they shared a family environment. Now, uh, Ishan mentioned that I was at the University of Colorado Boulder doing a postdoc in quantitative genetics, which provided me, you know, a wonderful statistical background for how you can actually do twin analyses, um, where you look and see again either half or all of the genetic material. So there, there's an assumption about the genetic contribution, and then the shared environment that's living in the same family, and then because twins also are individuals there's a part that there's not a correlation because those are non-shared environmental influences that might influence uh, behavior, health, whatever we might be studying. So now let me turn to and share with you some of my program of research. Um, it's involved both individuals and twins and family studies, uh, and also primary and secondary data. Primary data is data that I collected. Secondary data is data that I've gotten by with a little or sometimes a lot of help from my friends. Um, I do also want to point out this is not a typo. This is under primary data, and it's the adult Russian twin study. It's a study that I did in Moscow, Russia uh, back in 1994, um, and we were looking to see the cultural influences. Everything else, most everything else that I focused on has really been looking at African Americans, uh, with a few exceptions, again, for my colleagues. Uh, but this was one that I was very interested to see if we could see how recent environmental changes might have influenced how similar we see twins. And so that's, that's fodder for another conversation. But I'm gonna to talk to you about the, the Carolina African American Twin Study of Aging, which is arguably one of the larger in-person studies of twins, of adult African American twins. Um, you never get there by yourself. And so here are just a good number of people who actually have been working with me over the years on different analyses that we've had of that particular study. Um, in that study, there's 285 uh, twin pairs and one of the things that happened um, instantly as I was collecting preliminary data was that we would find pairs of twins, but only one of the twins was still remaining in life. And that was the effect of health disparities very quickly um, or, or minority health very quickly having a big impact on who was gonna be available to be able to study. So in addition to twin pairs, I actually went ahead and interviewed people or my staff interviewed people who were what we called singletons. And if we could get a sibling with them, we would put a sibling with them. Those twin pairs uh, and siblings and singletons range in age from about 25 to 92, all done in North Carolina and were home interviews. Um, as you can imagine, trying to do this study now would be virtually impossible. And I'll talk about that in just a moment uh, because of COVID-19. But during this study, we were able to collect a lot of data on health, particularly cardiovascular risk factors, memory, physical functioning, mental health, personality, and social factors. In our final uh, uh, collection, we ended up having, in terms of number of subjects, not pairs, um, 202 who were identical twins, 364 fraternal twins. And I'm actually very proud of that difference. There are actually far more fraternal twins than identical twins. I think we think that there's a lot of identical twins because when you see them, it's always so exciting and interesting, but actually when you look at population uh, estimates, you see far more fraternal twins than you see uh, same uh, identical twins, which gave us uh, this nice sample of 706 people. Um, I like to show this picture because it shows <clears throat> that those twins didn't just come from rural places or from urban places. They were pretty well distributed across the state of North Carolina. Um, and in lots of different places. And so um, it's, it's another kudos to uh, the incredible staff that I had at the time collecting that data. Um, this is just a map that I have made over the years of all of the different uh, variables that we were looking at in terms of trying to take a look and see about the variability in health. And so there's lots of different ways we'll do it. I've got a couple of examples for you, but I've thought about it earlier today that, that they're mostly uh, psychosocial variables or they are psychosocial variables. Uh, but ones too that we think about and are connected to health. And as you see, if you look at depression, you find that, um, oh, the little table is off, but the blue part here is environmental. 
And so there's a bigger contribution of, of environment than there is to genetics to looking at depression. Um, the ticks is a measure of cognitive impairment. And what's neat is, is that that little yellow piece there is shared environment. And remember, that's the environment that comes from having been in the same family. And for a lot of things that falls out, but interestingly enough in this sample, um, it stays in the modeling that we were done. And then um, I think as many people again would assume, uh, a lot of environmental variability that's accounted for in perceived stress and less genetic, the same thing goes for coping. So just to try to tie this all together, the results suggest that her uh, health disparities um, the differences that we find, the differentials, the, 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 the disparities of the poor health that we find is definitely a family affair. Uh, the genes are associated with disease conditions, but they're modified as well as maybe being constrained by the environment. And I mentioned about gene environment interactions and those would be wonderful things to be able to do. They're far more complex in terms of being able to figure out how to do them, but um, might tell us a lot about what's going on, that it's not just our genes, that that environment is critically important. Um, it also demonstrates just a little bit about the intergenerational transfer of health um, shown in some of the family effects that are there. Uh, that work led me to think a lot more about intergenerational transmissions, particularly of stress. And I made this little map or this little diagram. I, as you can see, I make a lot of them. And I really thought about both some of the social learning that goes on in genes that contribute to stress um, stress being important because stress underlines uh, a lot of the chronic conditions that are the things that take out uh, ethnic minorities and particularly African Americans, stress, depression, uh, 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 variables such as that are very, very important. But because we have not seen a big change in mortality, um, that at least not as a gain in terms of in decreasing the differential. It's not, it's not been uh, reduced because of advances that we've made relative to uh, uh, medical advances. We still find that big difference. And I think some of it is because some of that influence is actually passed on from generation to generation. So things like financial strain, occupation, neighborhood racism, all of those are influencing stress, but there's some social learning that goes on in my mind and families. And that's how some of it is still then carried on from generation to generation. This is also highlighted a bit, um, and but in a very, very different sort of way uh, about um, what ends up happening. And so uh, when we look at black, white uh, life expectancy, we find a huge difference at 40 years of age. And this carries on um, as we look in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, and, but it's interesting when we get to the 80 year old age group, we find that there's not a big difference. So it's like, if you can last long enough Heck, your life expectancy is just as good as it might be for, um, for other groups. But even, even more interesting is, is that then when we get to 90 year olds, there's actually an advantage that um, African Americans are more likely to be able to have longer life expectancies when they get to these very late ages. The issue is, is that you don't see as many get to those ages because we look at population differences um, relative to mortality. So I give you that in part as a background to say with all of these studies, um, one of the, my, I wanna argue and say it's my last one, but I'm not gonna say that for sure, but it's definitely what I thought was my last good idea, which was to take a look at longevity and look at stress in African-Americans and see if we could try to explain what was happening intergenerationally with health uh, and other factors related to health. Um, I'm watching my time here and I don't want to spend too much time just focusing on these research questions, but um, we want to look at family familial effects. We wanted to see if stress accounts for differences and patterns between different families. Um, also look at psychosocial factors like stress coping and discrimination and see if those patterns were related to longevity and also see the role of genes because they, we know that they play a role. Um, and there have been several uh, studies uh, promoted by the National Institute on Aging supported by the national aging, but um, they tend to have very small um, uh, uh, populations or samples of African-Americans. And so we wanted to be able to contribute to that knowledge and also wonder if there are gene environment interactions. It's a little harder to get to, but it was a goal or a research question that we had. 
Um, I'm going to be very, very brave here and show, share with you this theory that I've been working on. This is what I do uh, in my lighter times when I don't have enough to do, which is almost never, but is to think about, you know, is there kind of a field theory of where there's different kinds of fields that interact to be able to produce variability? And here it's environmental things like education, religion, discrimination, family context that interact with individual factors like personality and genetics, which contribute to anger, coping, hey, the guy that I'm really interested in, which is stress, and that that leads into and interacts in such a way that you have variability in outcomes, um, one of those things being longevity, but also health status and, and cognition. So that brings you to uh, the current study that we have in the field right now, which is a study of longevity and stress in African Americans. We like to call it SOLSA. Um, and in that, we have some specific aims. I'm going to skip that just for the sake of bringing this uh, to a conclusion. But I do want to tell you about the research design. Um, what we decided to do was to create <clears throat> two different family types. Uh, and those are family types where there was not a older generation that was still alive. And uh, we do ask about um, how the parents passed away. And you know, almost in inevitably, there are accidents. There is uh, 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 things like murder that go on as well, but a lot of them is, is because of cause of chronic conditions. But we call those our short-lived folks, and we are collecting data on um, two siblings that are within the same family. But then we have these other families we call long-lived families. And in those families, the siblings are still there, and at least one of the parents are still there. And so um, our goal is to get 150 of each. We're already there with the short-lived families, as you can imagine, because there's more of them. And the long-lived families are the ones that we're trying to get now. Uh, I will tell you just of one of the realities that we exist is that um, we have been doing, we had started off doing these as in-person interviews, and now we've switched to doing them uh, uh, by phone. And we're going to analyze and see if there's differences in some of the things that we collect when we do it by phone. But it will be interesting to see some of that and um, we didn't want to let COVID stop our progress, and we didn't want to try to wait two years to be able to finish our data. So we've gone ahead and moved forward. And so we'll see how all of that turns out. Um, here's another one of those conceptual maps of looking at all of the different things that we're trying to study related to and what drives longevity in terms of stress, physical functioning, health status, uh, genetics, psychosocial factors, cognition, and dem demographic factors. Um, what I like is, of course, uh, being able to think about the different kinds of comparisons that one can make. Uh, and one, you could look at a sibling effect, and regardless of family type, you could look at one sibling compared to the other and see if they're alike. And this is as people who are 50 and over to see what the similarities are. We can also look at a familial effect by looking at the type of family we have. So we'll look at siblings that are in our long-term category and siblings that are in our short-lived category. But we can also look at a generational effect by looking at how much that parental gen generation is like maybe a mid-sibling mid score for our, lo our long-lived siblings and be able to look at that effect as well. What I'd like to do now is to be able to conclude and to just put all of this in context and think about um, some of the opportunities and challenges in terms of studying variability in health and aging using family designs. Uh, they include in terms of the challenges of understanding complex patterns of health within family by disentangling genes and environment. Um, it's amazing how easy it is to be able to collect information on genes and you welcome your kind of open yourself up to an incredibly different world if you're a behavioral scientist uh, and very, very valuable data that we'll be looking at. Uh, measurement across generations uh, by looking at then social change. Um, I can't help but to, to share just a personal um, event that happened. And that was that as, uh, as a university president, you have to send out messages and you have to send out messages about things that are going on. And I sent out one yesterday after the George Floyd uh, verdict. And in that message, I shared with people that um, one of the interesting things was is that um, you know I have worked with my stepson to tell him about things that could impact him um, uh, in, in situations maybe where he was dealing with the police. And um, I think that it was very interesting thinking about now how he's going to tell his kids about how you deal with the police and what is fair and how our, our culture and how our society ultimately deals with this 
with the hope that it's going to be better. Um, complex interrelationships between SES behavior and genes is going to be something that it's a challenge, but I think it's a doable and a, 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 a possible challenge that we can answer some very interesting questions. And also trying to figure out some of the pathways about how health and disease uh, and see then how, if we understand those things, we can see if we can eliminate some of those disadvantages. Like, is it just good neighborhoods? Is it eating more fruits and vegetables? Is it that we live in, in, in food deserts and so we can't get those sorts of things and that that contributes to cancer, which is uh, one of uh, very uh, viable uh, uh, proposition that's been done and, and considered. Um, is it living in the right neighborhoods? Is it picking the right parents like we get to do that? Um, what kinds of impacts do those things have? But there's a lot of opportunities, like examining the extreme impact of stress on health, understanding the impact of culture, and looking at that across generations, uh, understanding how genes are impacted by environment. Um, I believe that we're going to have many more studies that are now coming out that um, do the more granular look at uh, how environments actually are connected to, driven by, changed uh, uh, change the, the things in terms of our genes and how those genes ultimately impact uh, health. Um, and so uh, also understand how intergenerational transfers positively uh, and perhaps sometimes buffer the effects of stress. Um, I want to think that uh, as a grandparent that uh, I'm, I'm good for the health of my grandchild. Uh, I hope that that's so, but I guess somebody will need to, to do a test on me and see and, and then do my, my granddaughter as well. So um, it's, who knows, that's possible. So with that, uh, I wanna thank you very much. Um, I'm right on time. I'm hoping we have some time for some discussion. And I did wanna leave for you, leave this up here. Uh, this is the, the paper that I want everybody to cite that I think as you think about the comparisons that you make, um, this will give you a lot of food for thought, both in terms of the statistics and the conceptual underpinnings of doing comparisons. And then I'll leave you also with sharing uh, some of the pictures of our fantastic twins that came from my twin study. With that, thank you very much. And I appreciate your time and look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodfield for that. I mean, I was gonna do this and I was like, me and Elizabeth will be doing our um, sign language for clapping. Um, but we are really, really um, just trying to chew on all the information that you have shared with us this evening. And we have already have a list of questions in the chat. So um, I'm going to just start from the top. Um, and if we, you know, if, if there are others, um, please keep them coming. But we have about 15 minutes to do questions. So thank you so much again for that uh, illuminating presentation. And I, I should just tell you, you probably already know this, but as a former student of yours, <laughs> and I have always um, recommended this paper um, to my graduate students when they come to me and want to do um, comparison work. So I am really, um, so I can tell you that I've upped your citations there for you. <laughs> but um, I'm going to start with um, Dr. Morgan asked a question. Can you elaborate why shared environment drops out of the analyses in family studies? and maybe why it stayed in for cognition? Ah, that's a tough one. Um, why does it fall out? Um, if, as you're studying older populations, it's because in theory, you have, you know, uh, and this is so traditional and, and I can give you a hundred examples in my, my twin study where this was not the truth. Um, but in the classic sense, what happens is, is that you know, you share that environment for the first 18 years. And then if we study somebody at 80, or if we, let's just make it 60, it's 42 years later. And some of those things are there and some of them aren't there. Um, I think also that in some ways in that, that twin model, what you do is that you get things that uh, they look like non-shared environment, but they actually may be shared environment, but they're showing themselves differently. And it's the level at which we look at them. Um, I, I can't even give you a good example of it, but um, I think that there's some of it there, but some of it is that we do become our own individual people and that it doesn't become as big a factor uh, in looking at them. But you do find factors like cognitive functioning where you do see it last. You know, the average age of that twin study is just over 50 years. So even in that example, it was, you know, if you were looking traditionally, it's the idea that that effect, that familial effect, which we don't have the specifics for what it is, but it's a familial effect, lasted 32 years. 
And so there are the power, you know, families do matter. They do actually, you know, have an effect that, that lasts over time. Okay. To follow up on that, um, Dr. Borgen asked, have you identified the drivers of longevity in your sample? Or can you give us a sneak peek to what you think those are? Um, it, it's, it's so funny. I was, I was harassing people about, you know, so you do group differences and, oh, you're surprised because you find a difference between groups. Um, I think the same thing goes with longevity. What we're starting to see, and um, actually we have done a, uh, an analysis on another sample, which was uh, uh, the Jackson Heart Study. And we were able to look at uh, family influences. And sure enough, what you find is, is that stress. Um, I have an idea and I should write about it sometime that stress is not, I think sometimes we think about stress as something that we just have, we learn stress. And I think that where we learn it from is that we learn it from our families. And it's not completely learning it from your family, but it's a big impact. And so sure enough, you find, then find similarities between um, the stress and even the kinds of health that you find in one generation than the other. And then it does explain a lot of the variability that you find in terms of health outcomes. So we found we, it's, it is very preliminary in our salsa study, but it, that's what's showing up so far. Um, uh, the piece that's going to be interesting is the coping piece of it. We've not done that analysis yet of saying, are there ways, if you can learn stress, you can probably learn coping too. And are there some ways, and I, I want to believe that in our long-lived families, hopefully that's what's accounting for it, is that yes, you know, maybe the stress is the same um, or the same level, but that it's actually dealt with better in those long-lived families than what we see in our short-lived families. Okay. Well, moving on, you shared early in the presentation a phenomenon of African American uh, African Americans refusing to claim an illness, quote unquote, claim. This is particularly interesting, and I'm wondering if you have explored this topic or are familiar with research that examines this practice of claiming further. Do you have any ideas about why this practice may be so common among African Americans? I think that there's a lot of reasons why, and my knowledge about it is completely anecdotal. It's from talking to a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, some of it is a lack of trust of the medical society to say, you know, I'm not, I don't believe what, what you believe. <clears throat> I don't believe about me what you believe about me. Um, and, you know, that's one driver. I think um, another driver is, is faith and belief. Um, I have this wonderful video. I wish I had a way to show it to you, but um, it is this gentleman who I'm interviewing. And I say, well, you know, uh, when was the last time you went to a doctor? And he kind of stumbles a little bit, says, well, you know, well, you know. And I go, well, what did they tell you? And he goes, well, he said, you know, you can't really listen to exactly what they tell you. Because sometimes they tell me this, sometimes they tell me that. He said, you know, um, I come down on it that they may be good, but they ain't no God. And so their belief is what, that they're going to be healthy and they're going to be protected, um, I think is something for a lot of older African-Americans is very, very powerful. Um, so mine's mostly anecdotal. I do think that there is a literature that's out there and I just haven't uh, uh, been somebody who's studied it, but I know that it's, it's a very powerful piece of how African-Americans think about their health. Um, that in some ways, um, that is how many, um, when you don't get health services, when you don't get health care, basically, you know, you have to say, I'm not going to let it stop me. I'm not going to let it limit me. And I think that it, it, it manifests itself in that kind of conceptualization about claiming it or not. I think not to add to your answer, because I, I agree with that. But I think even during the pandemic and with the vaccines, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about why people weren't believing, you know, in this whole idea of COVID um, and that they can't get it because God told them they weren't going to get it. So I do agree that there's some spiritual um, understanding and meaning that people put to, um, at least in the Black church that we, we call it, you know, in, in having these conversations. So um, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, why don't we care about the cultural bias in our instruments anymore? I'm reading verbatim, so I'm, there yeah. you go. 
Okay. No, and I don't know if they were just repeating what I said or whether they believed that themselves. Um, but, um, you know, early on in my career, I did uh, a number of papers that were measurement papers and journals were very accepting of, well, not very accepting of them. It was hard to get them then, then it's, it's murder to get them in now. And, um, I don't know why that turn has been, um, you know, we need to really pay attention to the measurement that goes on in our studies, uh, because I think that there is so much error, um, particularly in between group studies. Um, because people are different. Um, that's what you find. And so why wouldn't you think then that difference actually impacts your measurement of them in the first place and that we need to be doing all of that. But I, I, I couldn't tell you why. Um, I, I think though that there is a lot of need for advancing um, understanding culture in the measures that we have. Um, the behavioral measures, you know, it's, it's definitely, but um, I think that there's even for some of the things when we're looking at um, some of the more, I don't know, biological versions of them, of that, you know, is it that you had a fear of something? Did the person, if you were supposed to fast, you know, fast before? There's other things that could be underlying those things. And we have to make sure we're open to what things are driving differences if we're interested in looking at differences or even what's driving variability because all African-Americans don't claim it. Mm -hmm. There's variability there as well. And so it's one of those factors that needs to be accounted for. If not, that error rolls into measurement. It, it just rolls into error. That measurement error rolls into error. And then we have less precision about what we're trying to actually measure or figure out. Well, I should have probably tagged this um, additional question onto your, your, um, the last one. So if you wanna expand on this um, question, please do, but it's similar. The person asked, you mentioned earlier in your talk about measurements and scales being culturally appropriate. Can you share how to determine if and when a scale becomes culturally appropriate? Um, like I said, you don't see as many papers. Um, there are, uh, I think sociologists do so much of a better job than, than psychologists do. Anthropologists do a better job um, of, of taking a look at those uh, kinds of measures. There was a lot of interest in some of the early work on discrimination measures about what culturally may be being seen, thought, uh, uh, looked at. And even people looked at acculturation measures. You know, I don't read every single area, so I wanna be careful and, and, and not be too judgmental about it, but you don't see that as much anymore. You don't see thinking that there might be the way in which people occult are, are acculturated that that ties into what you're measuring. Um, I think from new immigrant populations that are being studied, I think they pay attention to it a little bit more, um, probably still not enough um, to understand what that process actually may mean as we're trying to measure these behavioral things that were standardized, developed on a completely different population and just applied to others. It's, it's, just, it's just fraught with the possibility of measurement error. And then you're not going to really know what's going on because you're, you know, the effect that you're really looking at has is, is been shrunk because a lot of it is just mixed up in error uh, that's related to the measure that you're using. Okay, so I'm gonna return to an earlier question and they ask, how do you collect genetic data? Like an example of some questions. Yeah, you know, that's, it's a very interesting question actually um, in, well, one, two, both of our big studies, uh, we had a big study that was done repeatedly in Baltimore uh, and then the Carolina study as well as the Salsa study. Um, we've used uh, buckle swabs uh, or spit to be able to get genetics from folks. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who say that they don't ever have any problems with collecting blood, um, but I have always heard of problems from African-Americans and maybe it's because I'm tending to work with African-Americans in the South, uh, but there is a belief and um, this is just colloquial terms, but you don't share your mud with anybody. And part of that belief um, is the idea that if you have someone's blood, you can control them, which kind of goes back into, you know, voodoo beliefs and, and, and African beliefs and, and lots of others. But um, it's so weird because a lot of times it's not connected with that but it is just the rule of that, you know, you don't just give away your blood to anybody. You don't know what they're gonna do with it. You don't cut your fingernails and just leave them around because you don't know what somebody will do with them. 
And so um, when we collect data, uh, genetic data, we always do that. We take it to um, usually a genetic center and they have the capabilities of being able to, to store it for us. Uh, and that's even gotten much better over the years because from our twin study to what we're doing now is gonna be so much better. We're gonna do GWAS and, and you know, uh, genome-wide uh, assessment of, of variables. We're gonna take a look at telomeres and look at longevity. We're gonna have a whole a bunch of things that are really the genetic piece of it, but then wanting to tie that back into what's going on relative to some of our psychosocial variables and how that may ch connect with whether you are in a short-lived or long-lived family. Okay. What differences are you finding from phone versus in-person interviews? And do you find people more forthcoming during phone interviews? Um, no. Uh, interestingly enough, we get uh, we we identify people, um, and our so far our rate of acceptance was higher for in person than it was over the phone. Um, we had actually we started off just calling people because we needed to keep our folks working, and we couldn't we couldn't actually do any interviews because we, our IRB doesn't didn't allow it. Um, and had lots of people said they were interested, but when it came to sitting down and actually doing it on the phone, it's not the same as sitting with somebody and talking. And so um, we are going to look at it systematically. I mean, it's, it's, it's a variable of factor that we will either take the ones that we are doing. We've got, I hope, no more than like 125 more interviews to go before we can finish. Um, we may end up having to take all of them out or we'll do something where we actually account for the differences that we find in there and then see if we there's anything left over um, from what we think is accounted for in the kind of interview that we actually collected. Um, but, you know, other than that, it takes about the same amount of time. Uh, you know, uh, we, we do a pretty good job of getting very, very complete data and answers and all of that looks the same. It's just uh, in terms of getting them in in the first place is a little bit hard and that's because um, people can't see who it is. <clears throat> in the twin study that we did, for example, it was always fascinating. Um, uh, a couple of my people would come back and say, I either got food, I got a marriage proposal, or I got an invitation to join the family. And I always took pride in that, you know, they, I knew they were very professional, but they did it in such a way that those people welcomed them into their home and that that made a difference. Um, so we'll see, I'm not sure um, I think that some of the measures that we, we take may have a bigger impact than others, um, but uh, I couldn't tell you which ones. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see. And so we've, we've taken COVID and trying to, to make a, not an experiment out of it, but, but kind of an examination of what those differences might be as we do an in-person versus uh, uh, on the phone or virtual interview. Okay. Well, since you mentioned COVID, I think I'm gonna skip around to another question, even though it's not, not completely related to what you were talking about. Um, but in order to better understand what you were saying about stochastic, will COVID change or affect this? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, it, it, it is very interesting. Um, for those of you who are out there um, and have the same challenge that I had, which was is that we couldn't just sit and do nothing for, you know, where it's over a year now, um, you know, and so you may have changed modalities. Um, it is one of those things that is a stochastic historical moment in time. Um, uh, I would love to believe that I'm gonna live uh, a long life and, uh, you know, maybe in my eighties or something like that, I'd come back and try to re-interview folks if, to see if they were alive. I don't see that happening, but if we could, it would be interesting to see what this moment in time actually did relative to their stress, relative to how much depression they have, even anxiety, which are three different measures that we have. Um, that's one of my assumptions of what might be different. Um, but what's interesting is, is that we do have social support, but we don't have, I don't think we have a real social cohesion. And I think that that's what's going to be a piece that will create variability in this moment of time. Because rather, you know, and, and at the same time, it puts us at risk uh, that if we have that better cohesion and people coming by and bringing us food and spending time with us, we may be able to benefit from it socially and it uh, help in terms of some of our mental health, but it puts us at greater risk as well. 
And in places like Detroit, where I was just at, what you see is this, you know, incredible differential of African Americans in particular, just huge differentials in the rate of uh, the contraction of COVID. And when I think of my friends who are there, they have these very strong family networks that do provide support for them. And so there is additional contact that's made. Um, and I do think that that's part of that additional risk that we're seeing for African Americans. Wow, I hadn't actually had a lot of thought about that, those processes, but you're exactly right, because that's, that's exactly what we're seeing, especially in some of these hard hit communities um, that, that's, that's that social network. Um, moving to another question, um, and I know we're over a little bit, but we have time in the schedule to do it if you're okay to hang out, Dr. Whitfield, for a few more minutes. Are you okay? I, I think so. I'm going to, I hope everybody wrote that down. I'm going to stop sharing, you know, as you're talking, I'm not going to be sharing my screen, but I'm going to check my, my calendar again. Yes, and, just, just so you make sure we're not keeping you from something. <laughs> they usually give me the hook pretty good, so. Um, okay. I just had a few more questions in the chat and I think we should be able to get to them in the next maybe five minutes. Um, let me get back to my section. You tell me when you're ready for the question. Sure, I'm ready for the question. Okay. In regards to stress, have you looked at how the birth order could matter to this? Um, like the older children feel more responsibility compared to those born later in life? Uh, we haven't, but Believe you me, we have birth order for who we get. Um, some of those families, this is out of North Carolina and particularly um, some of our older ones come from pretty big families. They can come from pretty big families. And um, that is something that um, in the past I've not taken a look at and I think is very important. When I was looking at twins, I didn't think about it as, as being as important, although we could take a look at that. Um, and I, I think that it would be fascinating. Um, once I get done, um, trouncing through my data like I do with everything else. Um, I am going to share it with anybody and everybody. So people that might be interested in, in birth order, you know, come see me in a couple of years and, and I might be able to share some interesting data with you. Okay, well, two more final questions and then we're going we're gonna to cut it off. Um, how have social determinants of health frameworks influenced your work? And how do you feel this impacts the effectiveness of comparative studies? And another part to that question. How do you deal with intra-group differences in your work? So um, the intergroup differences are what it's really all about. It's that anybody, you know, I think I struggle sometimes, because, and I'm guilty of doing it sometimes too, of saying Blacks are like this. It's like, no, 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 no. Some Black people are like this, or this happens in Black people. Um, those, those frameworks are fantastic to get started, but they're only a starting place. Um, I do think that there is far too heavy a reliance on differences and all we ever get to is differences. Um, there's been work uh, by some folks that have looked and, and at least said, well, it's educational differences that actually create these differences between two groups. And I, I like that at least as a starting point. But then I asked them the next question. So what is it about the education? Um, some of the work that I've done was looking at desegregation because I made the assumption that, hey, you know, actually um, in Baltimore, I'll tell you the very quick story. When you look at desegregation, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, there were three places where desegregation started, Washington, New York, and Baltimore. And interestingly enough, in Baltimore, the white kids went to where the black school was, not the black kids going to where the white school was. And I was always just fascinated by that. And I think I could do a hundred more studies and never finish answering all the questions that come came from that. But it's the idea that that if you went to a segregated school versus a desegregated school, some people make the assumption that the segregated school was not as good a quality. But others say that those schools had teachers that really cared about the black students, so they may actually do better. And in some cases, and you should look up some of my papers on that, and I'm not gonna try to repeat all of the data or all the results, because I probably can't. But what you find is, is that there's not differences in everything. That, that there are actually some times when here's the example of um, not finding differences actually really shows you something very interesting. That, that they're actually on certain things, there actually is a similarity or that there was an effect of desegregated schools. It wasn't necessarily 
a poor one. That's the argument that one can make from it. But um, I, I do think that there, there are good ways to start because they do start pointing us towards important variables and things that we should be considering. Um, but we should be limited to just doing between group studies. Um, that's <clears throat> working with um, uh, Jack Rowe. I think, you know, if you know the field, you know, uh, famous researcher, um, did a lot of the MacArthur data. And I thought he was so smart. I, I had to go to him and ask him um, because the people that I was working with said, well, you can't just do within group. We always do it between. And I said, no, 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 that's, that's not it. And so I got to go see, sit and talk with Jack Rowe. I really did it by phone. And I made the argument that, you know, we don't understand what the within group is. How do you know that you're not comparing apples to oranges and that, yeah, they're two different fruit. Whoa, big deal. You haven't learned anything. And he looked at, well, he didn't look at me. I could hear him on the phone. He was shuffling papers. And he said, you're exactly right, Keith, go ahead. Um, and I thought he was such a forward thinker to not limit himself or limit what his data could actually contribute to just what was different between the two groups. Uh, oftentimes what you see is that you don't even see race even analyzed half the time because if they have a diverse group, they don't have enough people to even fill in any kind of argument for cells between the two groups. Uh, or they do it and they just put in race and it comes out as a factor, but they have nothing to explain about it. Or it doesn't come out at all. And that may be because of lack of enough people to even show a difference or variability. Um, again, we can talk about that all day long. I wonder sometimes when you find um, a smaller number of minorities that are in a study, it makes me more curious about who that group is because it means that everybody else didn't want to participate in it, but these guys did. So are they the ones to really compare to say that they represent a particular subgroup, if we're talking about African-Americans, African-Americans, and compare them to whites? And then when you find differences, what does that really mean? All right. Well, thank you. Well, this is our last question, and then I'll turn it back over to Dr. Burgess to close us out. But what factors help individuals to be resilient in the face of stress as it relates to health? And can families or other relationships help to build resilience? And lastly, are there interventions to reduce stress to build resilience that could make a difference in longevity? Um, I think that there are actually, you know, he's if he's not on this call, he's definitely in this area. The work that Bill Haley has done, Olivia Clay has done at looking at interventions. And those are the things that you, one can do. And uh, it's a lot around caregiving, but, but that is one of the central pieces. And I think that some of those interventions might be effective. Um, you know, the other things that you asked about, that's why we did a study. That's why National Institute on Aging gave me $1.52 um, was to be able to try to answer some of those questions um, with, this, with this particular attempt. Um, I think that what we're gonna find is, is that coping is gonna be big. I think there's gonna be some social cohesion that's gonna be big. Uh, and even looking at, we probably got six different measures of, of perceptions of stress. And I think depending on what kind of perception you have of stress, whether it's chronic, whether it's acute, whether um, it's, it's long-term or short-term, um, you know, that's gonna have some effect of, of how those things are related to other chronic conditions that we ultimately have and being able to lead to successful aging. The part that I'm most excited about is that um, we do have a hundred year old that's in our study. I, I think that there's some more out there, but we just haven't been able to find them. Um, but we've got a lot of 90 year olds. We probably got 20 90 year olds in our study. And I'm very curious to do something, you know, it's not gonna have big sample size or a bunch of power, but it's gonna be interesting seeing these are 90 year olds. They probably lived 20 years past their life expectancy. If you want to figure out how you live long, those are the people you want to know. What do they look like? How do they perceive the world? How do they cope with things? Um, are they depressed? Are they not depressed? Because they would be the ones to me that are going to be very, very fascinating. So um, lots of work to do. Um, I just have to do that president thing uh, as my day job. And then on the nights and weekends, I can look at my data. So uh, I thank you yeah. very much for those questions. Those are, are wonderful questions. Um, and I hope too, I just wanna uh, say that uh, I wish we could all be together. Um, we, it will happen. Um, we have to stay the course and we have to make sure that we're safe, uh, but science does not stop for anyone and that you all are doing this, I think is wonderful. I wish you continued luck and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Keith. Dr. Burgess. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Whitfield. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for doing the Q&A. Um, things were coming fast and furious. You handled it beautifully. Um, normally, this would be a chance where you would you would see the audience and get a round of applause. Um, but I know from how much my phone is blowing up, and I bet Dr. Williams' phone is blowing up as well, the dialogue that's already going on in the community as a result of this talk is really exciting. Um, and I've, I've only got a taste of it um, blowing up my phone right now. So we are so pleased to have you here and honored. And we look forward to opportunities for you to visit SGS and Georgia State again, you know, when you're not busy with your day job. <laughs> Well, I have lots of friends at Georgia State. I have a couple over at UVA. Um, I think you guys are doing the most important thing, which is, is that you're still sharing knowledge. Um, you can't let our current situation limit that. And so uh, I applaud all of you all for what you're doing. This is wonderful. Well, thank you. We are gonna turn to the entertainment portion of our program. You are 